Greetings, I'm John Duvall and this is the Truth Factor Discussion. We'd like to thank you for taking time out of your week to join us for this time period of discussing the Word of God, of factoring the truth into our daily lives. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you all today? Let's start with you, Paul. Doing great here in South Central Indiana, and glad that uh, there are several who have joined us. Normally our number increases as we go throughout our hour-long study, and we're just glad that you're here to factor the truth into uh, the daily lives that we live, the truth of God's Word. If you're watching us on the video stream, you'll see to the right there uh, it says uh, TF Discussion, and if at the bottom of that you click on a guest or one of the other logins, if you prefer to use that, but if you just use the guest login, you can just uh, it'll assign you a guest name, and you can just type your name over that and log in, and that'll allow you to make comments in our study. And certainly we appreciate your your comments, and we bring those into our study as we as we go through. And you may have questions or comments, and you may agree or disagree with us, and we'll be happy to take those comments in either case. How are you today, Tom? Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, like I told you all a little bit before, out here in Southern California, it's uh, we're we're baking a little bit today. We're we're several degrees above temperature and have uncharacteristic humidity. But nevertheless, we're there's still uh, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good enjoyment, and um, great to be a part of a study such as this. Great to be in a country where we can study like this with. We still have the freedom to do so without fear of reprisal from our governing authorities. That's true. That's very true. That's very true. I think sometimes that we might maybe take it for granted sometimes. Yes. Um, but we do, if for, for all the problems that we like to identify in our country, we still have a lot of freedoms and this is one of the things that we're so thankful that we're able to do and with the current day technology I mean individuals in England such as Barrett can join us live for this Bible study and hear us in real time with maybe a minute delay at best or at worst I would think people in the Philippines or wherever throughout the world can join us for our study we could Skype that is talk face to face with someone around the world and 10 years ago, it would have been expensive. 20 years, almost unthinkable uh, when you think about the cost structure of what we're able to do today. So, right. Now, if we look better to you, it's not because we've applied makeup or anything such as that, especially me. Nothing there. Um, it's all Google Hangout. What Google Hangout or YouTube has done, they are rolling out a high definition. And so you know, up until this point, all of our studies have been standard definition, which is typically 856 by 480 um, in the 16 by 9 framework. But what they're doing for the technical geeks out there, they're going to drop the H.264 and go with the VP8 format, which will allow the, the Google Hangouts to now be in high definition, which is 720p or 1280 across and 720p down. And um, if, if the webcam supports it, and once it's rolled out to you, then when you enter into a Hangout, you can activate the high definition. And so for, for you on the viewer end of it, if you'll look down at the little video window that you're watching, and you'll see what should be, it looks like a little gear uh, down there. If you'll just click on that, you can change whatever resolution. If you have slow internet connection, go 240p, 360p or 480p or try the 720p and see if the video looks any better to you. If you so go there, full, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry, John. Okay, oh, go, go ahead. I was going to say, if you go full screen, what you'll see is, like right now, uh, you'll see that uh, on my bottom of my window, uh, you'll see the uh, the gra uh, the text is probably just a little bit fuzzy. Uh, of course, it's very clear as I'm broadcasting from here, but it's just a little bit fuzzy. But that's because I've not been able to uh, get the upgrade yet to the uh, HD. But then I'll switch over to John here. And as you look at his text, if you're watching full screen in 720p, you'll see that his is extremely clear, uh, the text at the bottom. And, of course, all the other uh, yeah. the, the, the books and things behind it. In fact, I can read that book right back on the shelf behind him there. Oh, very good. <laughs> not, re not really. Oh, no. Um, right. Now, Barrick does comment in the chat room that it's not as smooth 
as the other meetings, and that that is a, an interesting side point that I hadn't really thought about. Um, it may take the Google service uh, time to get the um, the stream and the buffering up to handle the higher resolution. And so, if you need to go to the 480i um, setting or the 360 for for smoothness, and do that as well. And we have an audio only stream as well if you're not able to see the video portion of our study. Um, anything in the news that y'all want to talk about before we step into our study? Uh, nothing we haven't talked about before. You know, uh, uh, other than uh, I, I guess our our country is our country is considering taking action against Syria because of uh, inhumanity. You know, on on their part. Yeah. yeah. You know, Let's so, see I mean, how that plays out. Yeah, we we'll have to yeah. wait and see how that plays out, and pray for yeah. wisdom. Play for yeah. pray for wisdom with our our leaders that they will do the right thing. Well, it's like Paul told Timothy in First Timothy two verse one that we yes. are to pray for our, our leaders that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life. Exactly. And so, yeah. All righty. Well, with that being the case, then let's go ahead and step into our study of First John chapter three. We left off last week with verse nineteen. And what we're going to do here at the start is read, beginning in verse 16, and let's read down through verse 23. Now, if this is your first time joining us, please bear in mind that it may appear we're jumping smack into the middle of a context, and we are. <laughs> but we have been going through this context uh, from week to week, and so if it would help, if you have time, you can step back um, after today's study and catch up on some of our previous studies by going to truthfactor.com and click on the studies icon and just find your way down to the Truth Factor studies there. So um, I won't ask Tom to read then, Paul. Uh, <laughs> Paul, would you read starting with this in verse 16 and read down to verse 23 and I'll bring the Bible up on uh, the screen share here. Okay, we're saying 16 through 23. Correct. Uh, 1 John chapter 3. Yep. And again, if you're joining us, we're glad you're here and hope that you'll open up your Bible, but John's going to post it online here uh, as we can uh, study together. The scripture says in this passage, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. All righty. Thank you, Paul. Let's back up there. Um, we left off last week, finishing up with verse 18 there. And reading that verse alone for the moment he says my little children let us not love in word or in tongue but in deed and truth and that's just building upon the previous couple of verses there the point is that our the point is is that our love for one another must be that which is genuine uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 12 verse 9 let love be without hypocrisy so the love that we have for one another must be a genuine love a sincere love one wherein if we have what our brother needs, we're going to be willing to give it to them. And so hence this love is to be both in deed and in truth. Now, with that being said, um, Tom, this, this kind of lays the foundation for what he says in verse 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth. By this love for one another, by this right. obedience to the love. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Tom? Uh, well, what I see in that is um, is obviously John is emphasizing the importance of having the proper attitude. Uh, it's it's very likely if you have if you have a proper attitude, 
your approach toward the Word of God is going to be what it ought to be. And uh, uh, you're more likely to be doing that, which is right. That's not to say that you cannot be in error because of ignorance and so on. But, but even if you have the truth, if your attitude is wrong, then you're wrong, you know, as far as God's eyes is concerned. Uh, and, uh, you know, dealing with the love in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, uh, uh, Paul there talks about, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am as a sounding brass or as a clanging cymbal. And he talks about if I have the gifts of prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. If, even if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, uh, it profits me no, nothing, or you know, I am nothing. Even if I give my body to be burned and give away all my goods, it, it's worth nothing in God's eyes. So the proper attitude has to be there, and, and that, that's at the foundation. And I kind of think that's the point that John is getting at in 1 John 3, 19. You know, uh, uh, we are of the truth. We assure our hearts before him. Love is where it starts. Now, I, and I know we're going to get into this. Uh, a point of caution that we have to deal with is there are so many in the world today that say, well, as long as I love God, that's all that matters. You know, as, I, as long as I'm pure in heart, it doesn't really matter if I'm right with what I'm doing. Okay. So. All right. Um, Paul, any thoughts? Well, I think uh, Tom brings out uh, some really good thoughts about uh, love here. And something that I think we've pointed out before, and I'll just uh, briefly restate, is that we use the word love in so many different ways uh, today. And we have to be careful that when we use the word love in, in Scripture yes. that it's the Bible word love. And it's not, you know, you love uh, pizza or you love your uh, truck, uh, but... Uh, that instead it's that kind of service that we provide for others that we will sacrifice ourselves for their good. In fact, that's what uh, John here defines it as, that we understand love. We know love because he laid down his life for us, and we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. I know I'm backing up a little bit, but right. when we understand that what he's talking about in verse 19, by this we know that we are of the truth, when we understand that kind of love, the sacrificial love that Christ had for us and that we are to demonstrate toward others, uh, we uh, are really getting a handle on the kind of lives in which we ought to live. Okay. Right. Yeah, if, if, if we love God and if we love, if we love God, we're going to love his teachings. Okay. And we're, we are going to continually be striving to ensure that what we are doing is right. Which, which, is, which is why we're going to continue to study the Word of God. And, and it's, it's in that sense that, that we can have hope because our, we, because our hearts are right. You know, the, the pure heart. Okay. Uh, the, the pure heart is at the, the, the foundation of the, life, uh, of, of the life of a Christian. Uh, without a pure heart, as Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 8, we will not see God. Okay. All right. Now, the, the context, though, of course, is talking about our love for one another, not so much yes. our love for God, which, which is a very valid, valid point that you make. Consider this tie-in, and I know we've got a couple of comments in the chat, we'll, chat room we'll bring in, but consider this tie-in when he says there, and by this we know that we are of the truth. Okay. Think about John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, and I'll bring that up on the screen where Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now here's the verse, by this all will know that you are my disciple, if you have love for one another. So do you, there seems to be a bit of a commonality between the thought here, that people will know that we are his disciples, by whether or not we love one another, and his statement here, by this we know that we are of the truth in that when we properly follow what the scriptures teach, we become a product of the truth or a disciple of Christ. Make sense? It does, John. Um, I just wrote an article this week, and I didn't think of it until just now, uh, but uh, there uh, it talks about if we love God, and there's some things that the Bible says about that. Certainly this is a very short article that's in our local newspaper, and so it doesn't. it's not uh, exhaustive. But it talks there in the last section about love for God requires loving fellow Christians. That we can't have a love for God without loving fellow Christians, but we also have to be faithful to Him and obey Him and love Him with all our heart. 
but I think that's an important uh, point as we as we think about our uh, service to God. Yeah, right. Um, I agree completely. Yeah, yeah. We we have some comments in the chat room that are related to what we've right. been talking about with love. Tom, let's go ahead and have you to read uh, Barrick's first comment there. Um, okay. Loving God is one side. Exactly. He, so he says there, loving God is one side. Uh, the other is the fear of God. Many love, but few fear. Fear of being apart from God when we love and and fear of God, or and fear God, what is important to God is important to us. Uh, what is an abomination to God is an abomination to us. So that ties that, that ties together uh, uh, our attitude toward God and our attitude toward the things of this world. And he goes you know, on. He, let, let, let's pause for just a second yeah. before we go on. I, I, it's, it's something just dawned on me as you were reading read what Barak wrote there. I think a lot of people love the idea of God, but they truly yes. don't love God. Right. Oh, they like the idea of Christianity. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've said before that, that I think many people love Christianity more than they love Christ. Right. You know, and they, they like playing church. They like playing Christianity. They like the idea of God. They love the idea of God. But as far as truly loving God, which requires that we have a fear of Him and a reverence for Him, many people lack. So it's a good point, Barrett. Very good yeah, point. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right, let me absolutely. jump back to the screen. Share, and you're good to go. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the next one, uh, Brian Haynes. You know, the world defines love as an emotion or a feeling. The Bible describes it as an action. And and you may recall that uh, I I have given a definition of this love, agape, as you care enough to sacrifice for what is best. And and that goes right along with what Paul said a little earlier in describing it and saying that that's how we read it in you know, in First John. That's the point. You care about right. others enough that you're going to do what's best. Uh, continuing our reading, uh, uh, Barak again says, yes, uh, obviously listening to something that we said, uh, we need to get back to calling Bible things by Bible names and do doing Bible things in Bible ways. And, and that has to do with defining love biblically. You know, Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call good uh, evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So we need to be careful, like using wicked for good and, and uh, gay for homosexual. Uh, and then he goes on and says, those two commandments are the two stones of commandments summed up. That's a very interesting point. I hadn't really thought about, I mean, he makes a good point there regarding the usage yeah. of words. Yes. You know, um... I read an article once not too long ago about reclaiming some words, and there's some words in, in both the English language and in Bible language that we, uh, we sometimes let, uh, let others rob us of. Uh, words like revival, uh, right. sometimes, sometimes words like baptism, words that are used in the Bible that are, are very out, outstanding words, but we have, uh, we've been, almost been robbed of them. We've been, they've been taken away from us, but uh, I'm wondering far, <laughs> far away from the comments that, uh, right. that are here in First John. I do. I've got a technical glitch on my side. I can't okay. get rid of my screen share. No problem. Um, bear with me just a moment here. Right. Um, if y'all want to con uh, continue on, go ahead there. Yeah, uh, Tom, I was uh, looking here in the next couple of verses, and he talks about that uh, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. But then in verse 21, he says, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence. Kind of uh, interesting there that uh, how good are... How could our heart condemn us? Now we realize God's greater and, and His wisdom is is above ours and everything. But did you have some thoughts about that? Yeah, and and I look at that and and I see that as a challenging verse. I see this as a verse that can lend itself to abuse. I think both ways. Uh, I see it uh, that goes back to the you know I, I feel that I'm right. You know, and they might look at this verse and say, you know what. Uh, as, as long as my heart is right, that's all that matters. Uh, but, the, but, but on the other side of that, there is some truth to this that we need to have assurance based upon if we have a proper attitude. And, and by the way, that's something that we can't hide from ourselves. You know, I mean, you can hide that from other people. 
but you can't hide from yourself that you have a proper attitude. And if you have a proper attitude and you also have, in addition to that, uh, the truth, uh, you have reason to have assurance that, that, that you're right in God's eyes. John, we were kind of discussing there uh, as we as we look at this, the idea of our heart condemning us, or our heart not condemning us, and having uh, and bearing that in with our relationship with God, and realizing that uh, we have to do what's right. I think is is a good way to uh, to describe that. We have to do what's right, uh, regardless sometimes of what a uh, feeling is, and so sometimes we have to do what's right, whether it makes sense to us or not. Uh, I've heard uh, on, on many different issues people say, well, I, I don't think that's uh, that doesn't make sense to me. I, I don't understand why God would say to do it that way. But if God did say to do it that way, that's the way that we need to do it. And so if our heart condemns us, our thinking, uh, our feeling about any certain matter, uh, we need to put God above our heart. Uh, what do you think about that, John? Well, yeah, you know, Jeremiah 10, 23 says, O Lord, the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. And relying upon feelings as the validation factor of whether or not we are right or wrong um, is not sufficient. Um, one thing to point out, and for the couple seconds I had to drop off for a moment, um, y'all may have already touched on this, but he says, and shall assure our hearts before him. Um, the Bible never teaches us that we can develop a level of arrogance because we've done what is right, but we have confidence in God and in His promises. Paul, uh, he says, I have finished the course, I have uh, fought the fight, and hence forth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Not because Paul was arrogant or boastful, but he was assured by the promises of the Word of God and the promises that relate to those who follow God's Word um, that he would receive this this eternal life. Hebrews tells us that we can boldly come before the throne of grace. And so when we look at our lives and we do what is right, we have the proper love, the, the love in deed and in truth, then we know that our hearts can be assured before him because we've walked in the path of his scriptures. Now, of course, that then lays down the, the, the ramp that leads us into 20 and 21, as y'all were talking about there. Right. Um, let's see. Um, As uh, we might want to pull in Barrick's remarks uh, coming uh, from England there. And I don't know, uh, gentlemen, who, Tom and John, if your screen is frozen or not, but our stream is still live. Mine's okay. fro mine was frozen. Uh, now it looks better. But as we, as we, uh, it was frozen with my, my face. <laughs> so, I was waiting for the stream to catch up. But uh, Barak here says that it's not just words, but how we live. And I think that's right. Reclaiming some of those things that we talked about earlier, and I think that was in the context in which he said those things, is, is, not, is not just simply um, rhetoric, but it's truly how we live and making sure that we have those things uh, in place in our lives. And then he mentions Deuteronomy 33.3, where it says, Yea, uh, he loved the people, uh, all his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. And we have to make sure that the word of God is what we allow our conscience and our heart, our feelings, our thinking uh, to be directed by. And so I appreciate that a lot. Did you see the latter part of Barak's statement there? No, uh, I did not because uh, I apologize. It says love here means that God... Uh, secretes us within himself, cherishes us, hides us within him. And so... Um, like, like, like he did the nation of Israel, you know, took them under his wing and protected them, and he, he, would, have, he would have been all that they ever needed had they simply followed him. And uh, Paul talks about nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, and I think that would be a, a very good parallel or, you know, connection at least with that verse there. So it's a very good point. Yes, very good point. Um, now let's talk for just a moment here about verses 21 and 23 for just a second, or 20 and 21. Keep in mind that within this context, he's not talking about disobedience. He's talking about obedience. He's talking about obedience right. um, and show in word and, and in truth and deed and in truth there. So, and, and our hearts are assured before him. He's already established that. 
So verse 20 he says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. This can't be a heart condemning us because we've done something that is wrong. Do you think it's more of just maybe a, a moment of doubt within our own self and our own service that he's talking about? Right. Paul? Uh, I'm going to pass that off. I was having to take care of something technical here. Oh, pass that off to John, or to Tom, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pass it back to John. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, yeah, no. Uh, like, like I said, I mean, when I look at the that verse, I, I see the challenge in it. I, I look at it from the standpoint of, it. It's obviously not saying that uh, if you, uh, if you, are disobeying God, that everything is okay. Uh, the the idea of our, I, I think that there might be a degree to which if we're not sure about something. Uh, we have doubts uh, that, again, God is greater in our heart. Uh, another thing that I would factor into this, you mentioned earlier that when we tie this into the entire context, as it's dealing with brethren loving one another and the way we treat each other, mm -hmm. it could also have something to do with that. For, for example, uh, if we doubt whether or not we've done something the right way. Yeah. You know, at, yeah. Yeah, and I actually have an example of that. Of just within the past couple of days, I had somebody contact me asking me for help, uh, financial help. Uh, supposed to be a brother in Christ, but I believe them to be in rebellion right now. Okay. But nevertheless, they gave me a story that is pretty tragic. And while I said no, I felt extremely bad about saying no. But I couldn't say yes, if you know, if that makes, because because I I know of the background. And since then, I've confirmed that it's it's very very likely that I was told to lie anyways. Yeah. You know. Uh. Uh. uh but I I see that I can kind of see that as an example of when you look at this verse as it's dealing with our treating one another as brethren. We have to have love, and we have to make decisions, and sometimes we might make a mistake. We might make the wrong decision, not necessarily sinful, but the wrong decision. And God knows what we intended. John, so, as, we, as we look at this, uh, I'll try to put my thoughts together now. I apologize. Uh, for a moment ago. As we think about these two verses uh, together, there seems to be a contrast there. And as you think about those, uh, it seems that, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have to just do what God says regardless of uh, our, our feelings. But once we get our feelings in tune with God's Word, it creates a great deal of confidence. If you think about that, uh, you realize that uh, we are not using our own human wisdom because if you would go by my wisdom, you'd find out that I, I make mistakes, uh, I have lapses in judgment, uh, and, and I think that's true of, of most of us. But when we do what God says to do, we're not looking at human wisdom, as you mentioned, Jeremiah uh, 10 earlier, but instead we are looking to God's wisdom, and so if our heart does not condemn us, if our heart and our mind, our thinking is synchronized with what God's Word says, then that creates an incredible amount of confidence uh, in our lives that uh, we know that we're doing what's right. The, the situation that I usually hear this, uh, I could most closely in, in my life uh, identify with this, is when a church has to withdraw from some brother yeah. who is walking disorderly. And people say, I don't think we should do that. I don't think that's right. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. I think we'll just drive them away. Well, if we're looking at that and we're doing just exactly what God's Word says, and I realize that there are some, some uh, difficulties in making sure that we apply that just as God's Word says we need to do, but if we're doing it just as God's Word says, uh, then we're doing what's right, and we're using His wisdom and not our own, and so we can have great confidence. Well, we're just doing what's right. Yeah. If it's going to work, His way is the way that works. Yeah, that that makes sense there. Um, so let me. I'm going to bounce back just a little bit on something I said just a moment ago. 
when I said that if our heart does not condemn us. Verse 20, I'm sorry. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart knows all things. Um, th there's a secondary possibility with, with that statement of our heart condemns us. It could be the case in point, like what we've already talked about, where we're not certain about whether or not we have done well enough. So we still we put our faith in God. It could also be referencing repentant sin. In other words, if I sin against God and I repent to God, while my heart may condemn me, I need to trust in God for the, the full forgiveness there. Um, and that might, might be a second way of kind of looking at verse 20 there. If, for if our heart condemns us. It may be a heart condemns us because of sin, but we ask God to forgive us. And so he, knowing our hearts and knowing all things, being greater is able to forgive us. You know, I think that may be uh, something that the Apostle Paul uh, looked at in his life. Yeah. If you look at the terrible things that he did, and when he says, uh, writes to the Philippians, that he forgets those things which are behind, uh, I realize that there's some accomplishments and some gain that he's referring to there, right. but I think there also had to be so, some terrible things in his life that he had to just forget about, yeah. uh, that they had been forgiven by God and he had to move forward. And press on, not not looking back at at neither at uh, either accomplishments or uh, earthly glories or the wrong things that he had done. Or the failures. And, and there's sometimes yeah. in our lives that that maybe we're just uh, overwhelmed with the wrong that we've done, yeah. and uh, maybe we look at some passages that tell us that we crucify the Lord afresh, and say, well, how could I possibly I live a life of unfaithfulness, and maybe a, a brother or sister in Christ who's in that condition who we're trying to help restore. And there comes a point in time at which I think you make a good point that even if our heart condemns us, if God said has said that He forgives us, then we need to move forward and live right, right before Him. And right. then the flip side of that, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Either right. either way, we should have confidence towards God. Right. Right. And, uh, yeah, uh, another interesting observation on this, because this deals with the mind games, and, and, I mean, I think sometimes Satan plays the mind games with us. Uh, while Paul tried to move forward, at the same time, Paul could not forget his past totally. You know, he brings it up, he brings it up over and over in a good way. You know, I, you know, I mean, when I, uh, you know, he acknowledges what he was. Uh, but he is he's not dwelling on it it's not consuming him so you're dealing dealing with it from that standpoint that's right you know guys we've got a comment in the chat room I'll bring into the yeah. discussion here but I was kind of looking at the number of folks that have joined us today and uh, we yes. have some we've not seen in a couple of weeks uh, Nakia it's good to see see you again and Brian it's good to have you with us and Barrick and John Case it's good to have all of y'all with us and we have it looks to be probably seven viewers that aren't signed into the chat room, so it's good to have you with us as well. The screen cuts off part of that name there, John. It's uh, John Casebolt. John Casebolt. Yeah. Ah, okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Right. I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's look at Barrick's comment to Tom here real quick. Right. And, Paul, I'll let you read this since um, it's about Tom. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and lecture <laughs> me. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he says, to Thomas, uh, we have to be a good steward of our, of our own selves. We need to take care of our own families. We need to look to 1 Corinthians 5, 12 and 13. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Uh, are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Uh, so when you refuse to offer assistance, you did the right thing. Uh, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think we, those of us who preach and uh, who are contacted from time to time for benevolent needs, uh, I'll be honest, I've been taken advantage of, uh, and I probably, unfortunately, uh, turned away someone who may have been very deserving of help. Uh, I try to err on the side of, of helping, but, but I know what you're saying is that there's times you, ha you just have to do what's right, and it may, uh, may be difficult. But what he says here, need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a passage, and uh, it's escaping me right now, that says, 
Uh, it talks about, uh, as your fathers did, so do you. You resist the Holy Spirit. And I think sometimes we resist the teaching uh, of the Holy Spirit. Barak also says there, um, uh, the heart condemning us reminds me of Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And he says, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And of course that's a, a scripture quote as well. It's a very good point. Very good comment. Um, the, and Tom the, just private messaged me. That was Acts 7.51. That's Stephen, who's talking yes. to those who won't receive the mm. teaching. Uh, okay. And and they uh, because they won't receive his gospel preaching, he says they're resisting the Holy Spirit. And when we resist the Word of God, we resist the Holy Spirit. And I was just tying that in with what Barak yeah. said a moment ago. And I, th I think that's a very good point, a very solid point, Barak. Um, there was, there was a, I'll tell you about a personal experience since uh, Tom's already shared his refusal to help someone. I'll share you mine, share, <laughs> share an account with you. I had a, had a fella a couple weeks back who um, wrote me and, and was claiming that he was about to be kicked out of his residence. Well, I knew some people that knew the fella and had worked with him and did a little bit of research. And long story short, I chose not to send the money because the situation he was in, he brought upon himself, not holding down a job. Um, I see what you're saying. Yeah, not holding down a job, not not being responsible, and and not living as a Christian should live. And ultimately, he brought the situation on himself. And um, it's you you have to make a judgment call. Um, yeah. Paul says, "If a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat." In First and Second Thessalonians chapter three, um, we we have guys who stand on the street corner down here at Memorial and and Penn and Memorial and Western, and you see the guys stand out there for three or four hours a day holding up a sign, you know, vet or this or that, and they all look capable enough of working a real job. But one of our members in a couple years back. He uh, pulled alongside, and a fella came to his window, and this guy had a farm and everything. He says, if you'll come work on the farm, I'll pay you $10 an hour. And the guy says, why would I want to do that? I'll make $20 an hour standing here. You know? Yeah. So, um, I, I actually have a, um, uh, I would call him my friend, uh, who uh, he was at one time who stands on the corner and begs. And I have another friend who picked him up. So get in the truck, and he took him to work, and he says, I'll work, but not on Friday. He says, Friday, I'm going to work uh, the corner holding the sign because uh, I can make uh, three or $400 on Friday night uh, standing outside of a nice restaurant, uh, an intersection near a nice restaurant. People have just got paid. You know, They've just uh, bought an expensive meal, and they'll feel guilty, and, and they'll provide that. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now I've made my own sign. And no, I, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I, I, hate, I hate to keep beating this dead horse, um, but I'll tell you something funny that did happen. Here in Edmond, Ron and I were at Mardell's, and this car drove up to us, a white car, and uh, the wife was driving, and the husband, I think, was in the passenger side. And one of them, I don't remember which one, said, you know, we never do this. We're sorry, but... Um, we need some gas money. My mother's in the hospital, and we're trying to make sure we can get there and to get home and so forth. And so I gave them five dollars. Then this was like Thursday, Sunday. We visited. I was on vacation, so we visited another congregation here in town and went out to eat with them, uh, with some of the brethren there. And keep in mind, this is 20 miles away, 25 miles away, and in the same parking lot, this white car drives up and starts talking to them. And the voice sounds familiar, so I step back and I, I look in and I listen, and it's the same couple, the same story. I said, oh, hey, I know you. I gave you $5 the other day. No, no, I've never seen you before in my life. Yeah, up in Edmond. <laughs> and so, needless to say, we watched the cars for a couple of minutes after they drove off. Um, but you have to use wise judgment and discernment. Yeah, exactly. So, and to tie that in with what we're talking about, just that uh, sometimes uh, it may not feel good to, to yeah. make a hard decision, a difficult decision. Uh, I think most of us are parents. It doesn't feel good to have to uh, spank our children or, or discipline them, correct them in, in whatever way that, that we uh, have to, depending on their age. But that's something that we, we have to do. And so when we're doing what's right, 
uh, we can have confidence that in that we're doing what God says to do. Yes, sir. Uh, but when we're, uh, but even if we don't feel it, <laughs> we have to do what's right. That's exactly That's right. right. Yeah. Now, verse twenty-two is a very interesting passage because it almost seems outside of the context. Okay. But when you connect it to the assurance seen in verse nineteen, shall assure our hearts before Him. And then in verse 20, we know that God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. And then 21, we see the confidence we have towards God. Then verse 22 makes sense. He says, whatever you ask and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We've been talking about since the beginning of 1 John chapter 1, the idea of us being in fellowship with God. You know, God hearing us. Um, First John 2, my little children, I write these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, propitiation for our sins. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And so we see a confidence that we have in God, assurances that we have from God being illustrated then or maybe brought to the application, if you would, into verse 22 there. Um, but the question is to what extent of our lives does this verse apply? I go to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night, and I do upteen Bible studies during the course of the week. All I asked God for was a thousand dollars to pay off a medical bill. Why didn't I get it? Isn't it interesting how we like to like to uh, rip things out of context. Uh, yeah. Recently, in our discussion of uh, Philippians uh, here at Ellettsville, uh, it just became glaringly obvious to me how often we rip Philippians 4.13 out of context, yeah. uh, where it says, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. And uh, you have to look at what's said before and after that. And here, I think that we're, we're looking at something similar. Uh, and that we have to keep this in context. Whatever we ask, now, if we think about whatever we ask, uh, that's a very, very broad thing, as John points out, uh, that we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So uh, I guess the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is the whatever? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and the bottom line, though, is, is one who is keeping the commandments of God, what's he going to ask for? A thousand dollars, John. Said. No, <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> that's that's the point. <laughs> that's the point. He's not going to ask. You. <laughs> well, let's. <laughs> all right, let's think about this for a minute. All right, think about our. Think about our. Take for example the Apostle Paul's life. Let's use him as a classic case in point. Okay, John says. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. All right, so there's a guarantee. Whatever, whatever the scope is, we ask, we will receive. But Paul prayed that the thorn of his flesh would be removed, and God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Okay, so when we talk about God answering in the affirmative everything that we ask, we have to define, as Paul talked about, what is the whatever? Is it the physical life? Or, and this is my contention, that anything I ask of God that pertains to spiritual matters, God will always answer in the affirmative. Right. Forgiveness of sin, yeah, yeah, exactly. wisdom, that's the, yeah, yeah. Those um, because physical, you can't. If if you if you say that it applies to things physically, then the the first time that God doesn't answer what you've asked for, then who are you going to doubt? Well, I guess I've not been keeping yeah. these commands well enough. Do you think, yeah, I, John, that goes back to what you said about the, the previous verses, that when you look at those previous verses and, and you look at uh, that our heart condemns us, that sometimes we can't, we have trouble forgiving ourselves, mm -hmm. but we have to just trust that God forgives us. And here he says that whatever we ask, we receive of him, that if just as Paul went and he trusted in the promises of God, uh, he, uh, as Ananias told him, ar arose and was baptized uh, to wash away his sins. And then as he lived before God and he had to, from time to time, go to God and ask for forgiveness, that 
in, in living his life that he had to be confident that those things that he had asked of God were taken care of? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Barrett brings up in the chat room here real quick. and uh, James Paul, 4. Yep. Yeah, if you'll read that. I'm, I'm looking for another verse real quick while you read that. Okay. Uh, so John's thinking about what he's going to say while we're... I'm just kidding, John. I, I know uh, there's a balance that takes place there. Uh, Barak says, James comes to mind here, James 4, 2, and 3. Ye lust and have not, ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. And so here, I think if I'm... Uh, understanding what Barrick's talking about is he's talking about asking out of the wrong motives and you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust that's one reason you don't receive what you ask for and so uh, as we uh, in a in a lighthearted way spoke of a moment ago asking for a thousand dollars does not fit that category uh, but instead uh, it it's a uh, selfish request rather than something that is uh, either appealing toward our spiritual condition before God or looking at how we can uh, serve God better in, in serving others. Sure. Um, praying for an, an open door of opportunity to teach the lost. You know, sure. Praying for the spiritual growth of the congregation, things, things like that. Um, the passage I was, I was looking for, and it's in John, between John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is in his final discussion, well, not final discussion, but uh, the primary discussion with his apostles prior to his death, and he gives them a very, uh, a very strong promise regarding prayer, and, um, and I'm not finding it right at the moment, but essentially he gives them the guarantee that anything they ask in my name, well, verse 23, there it is, I'm sorry, John 16, and in that day you will ask me nothing, but most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Um, until now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now many times people will, will, will go to that verse right there and say, see, whatever we ask in our Father's name, he will give it to us. But again, the problem is context. You know, this was a promise to the apostles. In that day when they would begin to teach, on that day of Pentecost, anything that they would ask God, he would give them. But again, all those requests would pertain to the job at hand, and that was evangelizing the world. So we, we have to keep in context what the Bible teaches in, regarding prayer, and, and um, certain things God will answer positively. If I ask him for forgiveness of my sins and I'm truly repentant, he will forgive me without but, but fail. this is not not uh, without a lot of misunderstanding in the world religious world oh, today. Uh, there are those who preach Not among brethren. Uh, well that's true. Yeah. And but there are those who preach a gospel of uh, wealth and prosperity. prosperity. Exactly. And uh, I've heard it referred to as name it and claim it. Uh, yep. And that is that they tell God what they want, and they go out, and that's that's what God's going to give them. And uh, it's not that's not the uh, what's under discussion here, so far as I can tell. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, uh, why would any Christian uh, ever have a need like Paul had, as you mentioned, with exactly. the thorn in the right. flesh? Uh, and, Tom, and, I I was going to yeah. pass off to you because I know I talked over you there for a minute. Oh, yes, and I was going to say, and that that would make uh, quote unquote Christianity self serving. I mean, it, it would make Christianity, uh, using that term as in being a Christian, uh, it, it would make it about this world. Yep. You know, uh, w uh, everybody would be converted, but they'd be converted for the wrong reasons. You know, ju just like, uh, just like the church that offers the steak is going to get more people. The church with the bigger gym, the church with the better band. Is going to get more people for now, and, I, and the reason I say for now is because when the church across the street offers a better band or a better different type of steak, steak yeah, and and uh, and uh, or they get tired of that type and they just want something different, they're going to go to the, whoever's offering whatever it is now. Or it's uh, time for my oil change, so I'm going to go across town this Sunday because uh, yeah, because they're yeah, offering exactly. a free oil change. 
Yeah, exactly. And and uh, but but get, getting back to a, a spiritual I uh, illustration, I think of like what John was talking about there with with things. I, I think of Jesus in Matthew. I should know this. That's Matthew uh, 19 or Matthew 18, uh, where he told his disciples, "Upon this rock I will build my church." 16. And yeah, 16, 18, and 19. That's it. I, I, I just mixed the verses up. <laughs> Anyways, he said to them, I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you loose on whatever you loose on in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, and whatever you bound, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. In reality, when you read that, the way it is written, it's it's really saying whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Yeah, yeah. And whatever you bind on earth shall have. So, so yeah. in, in other words, it's not carte blank. The apostles are going to, uh, again, you know, be able to go to the casino and will the wind, you know, at the slot machine. Is it carte? <laughs> yeah. Is it carte blanche? Carte blanc, blanc, whatever. Blanc. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, blank check. Let's just say you, blank check in English. So, that's what it means. And you are right. You are right. Yeah. Oh gracious. Yeah. Um. You are correct, <laughs> because in Matthew 18, later on in 18, he does make the same statement that whatever you bind in earth be bound in heaven. Yeah. So it is in yeah. both 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 passages there. Um, well, why you oh, know? Oh, good, glad. I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm, I'm glad I thought that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the whole health and wealth doctrine. I mean, why wasn't Paul richer? Why did Paul have to learn to be a base? Why didn't he learn his whole life simply to abound? Right. You know, exactly um, right, and, yeah. and and I'll tell you right now, God becomes a respecter of person if that is true. I know a number uh, of Christians who are faithful Christians, but yes, uh, yes, absolutely. You know, if you oh. suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. That's what about the well? The majority of the third, the third world. Yeah. I shouldn't even say the majority. The third world period. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, look, look at look at the Christians that you have in down in South America. Um, uh, some places in, in the Philippines and, yeah. and and some of these yeah. places where they have they have nothing. I mean, they barely have a roof on their head, and in some cases they don't. You know, and they're yeah. just as content as they can be. Yeah, so, and we shouldn't go to an extreme of saying yeah. that we shouldn't pray for brethren in hard places no, that's and in not di the point. difficult things, but uh, just in praying for their burden to be eased and right. doing what we can to try to help them. That uh, that we understand that part of the um, you yeah. care, I, I want to use the phrase human condition. I don't mean that in some right. spiritual sense, but right. part of just living on this earth is that there is some difficult times that will have to be endured. Uh, otherwise, if there were no difficult times, it would be like heaven. Yeah. Uh, but instead, we look to a place where God will wipe away every tear. And if we can pray for things that are not spiritually related. Paul says, Philippians, let your request be made known unto God. We just don't need to expect a yes answer for every physical request that we may make. So you're right. We need to pray for those brethren. Um, we've got a couple comments in the chat room we'll bring out. You know, I was thinking about what the talking about what churches offer, stake and so forth. There's two things that Seminole Point Congregation offers here. Bible teaching and a handsome preacher. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm afraid our connection maybe dropped very quickly. Yeah, our, our count's going to go down real fast here. Um, let, let's let, let's go over to Barrick's comment, starting about uh, with the wrong motive there, uh, Paul. Okay. Uh, he was saying yes that with the wrong motives. This is what his yeah. reference to James chapter four was. Then he says it goes back to love and fear of God. Uh, if we are following God, we will only ask for those things that fall within His word, and appreciate that. Then in the context of the discussion of uh, uh, health and wealth prosperity gospel, he says, ha, I put dirty handprints over many things after learning that and then discovering that it's bogus, the whole uh, name it and claim it doctrine. And so we have to, <laughs> yeah. I'm not, not sure I follow all of that, but I get the idea anyway. Well, earlier one of you said, you know, you just lay your hands on it and you'll get it. And so okay. he says he's laid his hands on a bunch of things, and all he's done is left fingerprints. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, so, well, sometimes people lay their hands on me, and it just gets my attention. 
He says also the loosing and binding covers the binding of Scripture to certain situations too. And I think it's talking about the uh, the Scripture that was quoted uh, as uh, as Jesus is promising his disciples what things will be like in the kingdom. Well, that goes back to what we're talking about with context of Scriptures. You know, Scriptures only bind within the context that those Scriptures have been given. Yeah, um, exactly. I'll use an example in Romans chapter 14, the very last verse, uh, whatever is of faith um, is, is sin, effectively. And I heard a preacher one time and talking about uh, no classrooms and everything. Um, he, he, he said, well, if it's not in the Bible, then it's wrong, because the Bible says if it's not of faith, then it's sin. But when you look at the context, that particular verse is used in a completely different context about conscience. And doing something that you believe to be wrong when fundamentally it's not wrong. Yes, you know, so it's just an, an example of how it's misused there. That's right. Merrick goes on to say just now, Paul learned to be content no matter what the situation. He says, My dad was sharing with me about a prayer for healing, uh, and the Holy Spirit asked, Will you still love me if you are not healed? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, again, uh, I'm just wanting to introduce his, his comment there. But uh, Paul did learn from a, a conversation earlier in his life, I guess, okay. with his father. Yeah. But Paul did learn to be content. Uh, he says when he has a lot, when he has a little. He, he even mentions when he's in need uh, versus when he was abounding uh, there in Philippians chapter 4. But, you know, is that not the question that we kind of perceive anyway? I mean, if, if we begin to think that God, that we... If we only love but God because of the things that he gives us, right. then it does beg the question, if he says no to our requests, will we still love him? I see. Or, or like a child, will we have a tantrum? Yeah, and throw a fit there. Yeah, when we don't get our way. Okay, I tell you what, we are past the moment. Let's take just a second and read verse... Well, what do you think? Should we plan to start with verse 23? If we had about five more minutes, five more minutes, um, I think we could probably look at 23 and 24. But at the same time, maybe we need to save these for next week. What do you think? I think we can probably wrap this chapter up if we uh, just take uh, not more than five minutes. Okay. Uh, if okay. anyone has to drop off, we're sure sorry about that. But I, I think it would be good for us to go ahead and... That's my opinion. Okay. Now, I'm thinking the same thing. Yeah. He says in 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. Tie this directly with his statement that because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Okay. So here's the commandment you need to focus on within the context of this. You need to believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and you need to love one another. This is the context. It's not to say there are not other things that we need to do, but in the context of this passage, that's what he's focusing on. Earlier in this chapter, he talked about practicing righteousness and loving your brother. Yes. And right. so, uh, so we're seeing that that's not an exclusive statement. That that's the only, as you mentioned, that's the only thing you need to do. But rather, uh, that's right. one thing that we right. have to do. Exactly. So this verse is not quoting the plan of salvation. Right. This is within context of what he's talking about. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, now, and, and, and we that's say that. important from, yeah. I was yeah. going to say that's important from the denominational concept. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, so, as he gave his commandment, now we touch it into 24 there. Now, he who keeps his commandments, I guess I should probably bring this up on the screen um, real quick here for everybody. There we go. And so verse 24, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So, you know, think about the first part of verse 24 there. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. There's that same Mino word that we've talked about before. Whatever state you're in, stay in that state. If, if I'm in an angry state, then I abide in the angry state. That's what Mino means. If I'm in Walmart and I stay in Walmart, I'm abiding in Walmart. Okay, it's the idea of whatever state you're in is abiding in that state. Well, here he says, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he 
in him. That is, abides in Christ, and Christ abides in him. Paul, is this not the very definition of the fellowship that we saw at the beginning of 1 John? Oh, I think so, uh, where we uh, would understand that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship uh, with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin. It says here, he who keeps his commandments abides in him. And notice that if you're talking about the abiding in, and some would tie the indwelling here, that uh, that here we have that he abides in us, and... Uh, we abide in Him as well. Uh, you have that going going both both directions. What, however, it is in one case is how it is in in the other. And he says, and I think that there might be something that we could tie there between keeps His commandments, and it says uh, that we know that He abides in us by the Spirit, whom He has given us. Uh, the commandments of God being revealed by the Spirit of God. But I'll. Uh, See what you fellows uh, have to say about that as well. Right. Tom? Uh, uh, one thing about the keeping the commandments and abiding in Him, uh, about the only thing I know about Greek is, is present tense. And, and those are yeah, present tense. Where's Daniel verbs. today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly right. But those are present tense verbs, which, which indicates yeah. ongoing action, and both of them are. Both of them are that which we do. I mean, so so uh, the the condition upon which God abides in us, as it's described here, is contingent upon us to continually keep His commandments and to continually abide in Him. Well, one of the things, and and I, I guess we need to do a study on this at some point. If if you study the New Testament. You'll find that the Bible refers to us abiding in Christ, us abiding in God, and us abiding in the Holy Spirit. Then you'll find passages that talks about Christ abiding in us, God abiding in us, and the Holy Spirit abiding in us. Now, we know, he says here in verse 24, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given to us. The Apostle Paul uh, says that he's given the Spirit to us as a guarantee. And when and many times there's a lot of discussion over when this actually took place, but I would suggest that when God sent the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said he would do in John 14, 26, and in John 15, and in John 16, when he sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and began revealing God's Word to the world, it was that moment when he referred to which he refers when he says he gave us the Spirit as a guarantee, and I think very possibly in verse 24, by the Spirit whom he's given us. We know through the Holy Spirit, through that Word of God there, that he abides within us and we abide within him as long as we follow his commandments. Well, that's exactly what uh, Brian Haynes is saying in the chat room, I believe. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he's tying 1 John 3.24 with 2 John verse 9, uh, where he says, uh, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God, and he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And he says, Here he has the Spirit. In 2 John, he has the Father. And it talks about abiding in the teaching the doctrine. And so that's what I was kind of saying that keeps his commandments uh, and yes. uh, what is uh, by the Spirit there I think go hand in hand, uh, the Spirit revealed word. Uh, I yeah. don't know that uh, in our discussions that everyone who's normally a part of the study would agree with that but uh, I think it would be a good study for us sometime and I would agree with what you said about the Father, the Son, the Spirit we abide in him, he abides in, they all abide in us uh, I agree with that statement. Um, and I, if, I'll try to make a note when we're done here to kind of put those passages together because I think the easiest word to sum it all up is fellowship, yes. and joint participation, you know, with them. Yep. Um, walking, you know, walking in the Lord. So, any other thoughts about verse twenty-four? The idea of keeping his commandments, we remain in fellowship with him. Um, and we know that we're in fellowship with him because of the guarantee of the spirit that we've been given. I think uh, now we're ready for chapter 4 next okay. week. Okay. All righty. Very good. And we'll give Daniel and Royce an opportunity to step back in if they go back and watch this and see that we've missed anything. Um, but otherwise, we'll plan to start then with chapter 4, verse 1. 
next uh, Wednesday. All right, any other final thoughts or comments? Gentlemen, Paul, let's start with you. No, thanks for joining us today. We're glad that you were part of this study. Lots of good comments today. Appreciate those who have joined in, and if you just chose to listen today, we're glad that you're here too, and uh, just always glad to be able to take an opportunity to study the Word of God, to use this technology that we have today to be able to uh, talk with brethren and talk with others from uh, so many different places in a study of the Word of God. How about you, Tom? Yeah, uh, uh, I echo those thoughts again. Thank you to everybody for everything, uh, <coughs> especially Barrick. From uh, as they say, from across the pond, uh, and 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 also Brian up here in the northwest, and then everybody else uh, with your your comments. Uh, we appreciate your being here um, uh, from week to week, supporting us uh, as we study God's word. It is our it is our hope that God is glorified by the things that are said, uh, that they are true to His word, and and we will be blessed with the opportunity to to do this once again next week. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a couple of things here. If you um, follow us, um, if you watch any of our videos on our YouTube channel, what we would ask that you to do, if you would, to consider doing is subscribe to our YouTube channel. That will help us in the long run. Um, if we have 100 subscribers or more, you can actually stream live without using Google Hangouts via YouTube if you wanted to. Um, but you can find more information about our YouTube page by clicking on the YouTube, I, YouTube icon at the, there at the bottom of the video window. We also have a Facebook page, um, and it's facebook.com slash truth.factoring if you'd like to receive notifications that way. If you have any questions or comments that come up during the course of this upcoming week, you can send them to questions at truthfactor.com, questions, plural, at truthfactor.com. And, of course, you can write to each of us individually. or Send it to Paul, send it to Tom, send it to John at truthfactor.com, and we'll definitely get back with you. Thank you very much for joining us, and um, it's great to have you all in the chat room today for our discussion. We hope that you can join us again next Wednesday, not, next Wednesday <laughs> at 11 o'clock a.m., that would be noon Eastern time. Right. 9 o'clock Pacific and 5 p.m. England time. <laughs> At live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week.